Hey guys, welcome to another episode of Screw the Stigma. My name is Afra and thank you so much for tuning in this week. Thank you so much for coming back. And there are new episodes every Monday, so do come back every week. And this episode will also be available on YouTube, so you can go check that out. All the links are in the description below. I update the people about my new podcast episodes as well as create some interesting content about different topics on my instagram page at screw the stigma pod and i have a facebook page as well screw the stigma podcast so you can go check that out once again everything is listed in the description below and um, this week's guest today we're talking about the stigma that surrounds mental health there's a lot of people with different opinions on mental health and i've learned that from creating even content on tiktok all right i have a tiktok now i create content on tiktok it's also at screw the sigma podcast and it's funny to think that people are so against talking about mental health and even when you do people are ready to jump on the wagon on how you're wrong and try to dump their own opinions on you it's just funny to me at this point how people are so persistent about saying that only their view is right this week's guest is hannah stainer from the psyche mental well-being podcast and we discussed all the stigma that surrounds mental health and she also shared her personal journey with depression and all the stigmas that she faced and what the UK is doing to raise awareness about mental health and I think it's a really important conversation to have so I'm gonna cut to that now. Hello everybody I have Hannah Stainer with me today. Hello Hannah how are you doing? Thanks how are you? I'm good too how how have you been? How's your 2021 been? interesting (laughs) I think it's fair to say um it's it's been strange because it started like quite well I was in quite a good uh, headspace um I had a sort of relaxed Christmas uh enjoyed food a lot and then I sort of started uh and January February really good and March was a bit of a bit of a blip um not so great and now April is kind of I don't know, uh, the sun's out and uh, that makes a difference. So yeah, it's been a, a mixed bag already this year. Yeah, what about you? Yeah, it's, it's been pretty much the same. It's been like an up and down cycle. It's like every month is like trying to figure out how it's going to go. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, for the listeners listening, would you mind just um, giving, talking about where, where are you from and just giving a little bit of, a, of an idea of what you do? Yeah, so I'm in the UK um, and I am a a mental well-being coach, youth coach, podcaster as well. So I'm always talking about mental well-being and mental health advocate as well. So I do a lot of volunteering as well um, with um, it feels like I'm like ticking off all the big mental health charities in the UK and like (laughs) doing stuff for all of those. Um, But it's something I'm I'm really passionate about uh, talking about and having conversations about and sharing. So that seems to have become kind of most of what my my life is about. So, yeah, that's that's really great. And I think mental health is something that we need to talk about more. And it's wonderful that you, you know, you're an advocate and you're raising awareness about it, which is really amazing. And I would like to know more about your mental health journey, your struggle with depression and when, when did you find out that you were depressed and how, did, how was your initial signs and how did you deal with it? Yeah, and, and it's funny because now with hindsight, I realize I've been depressed for a long time before <laughs> I actually figured it out. Um, and so it was um, probably around, my, I was probably around 2021 uh, when I realized and I um, was at university or just finishing up university and um, there were kind of, two um, events around that time one I was kind of commuting for work and driving and I remember having this thought in in my mind of seeing like the traffic ahead and thinking like what happens if I just don't stop mm-hmm. like my brakes and thinking this maybe isn't the healthiest thought to be having mm-hmm. and thinking well maybe there's something going on um, but actually I did some mental health awareness training uh, for my work And they were talking about depression and I honestly was nearly crying because I was like, oh my God, they're (laughs) completely describing how I feel. And that was the first time it clicked that actually there was a kind of a name for how I was feeling. Um, And then I went to to the doctors and that kind of started off that process of of getting help. But 
now kind of looking back I think probably from at least like 13 but possibly before there had been you know some anxiety there and, and depression so um yeah but it took, me, it took me a while to realize what it was so I think it's great that you did finally figure out that it was depression but where it was your friends and family kind of know the concept of depression was the society back then kind of open to the talk of depression that makes me feel really old <laughs> <Back> then, <laughs> but, um, <laughs> back then um, like a few years ago <laughs> but back in the i don't know the 2000s oh my god 2000s um anyway <laughs> um i think they I think there, there was that awareness mm-hmm. of it. Um, but I think, um, you know, my, the way my depression is always presented is something that often is called like high functioning depression or smiling mm-hmm. depression in that for me, if I'm kind of alone with my thoughts, that's maybe the worst place to be. So I have always kind of worked or, I mean, university, I did occasionally miss some lectures and mm-hmm. I find it difficult, but I think most students probably have um so I was still working and um you know and I think I'd moved away from home to go to university so um you know I didn't have really my friends and family around in the same way so it was difficult to kind of see and I think the fact that I was you know I was holding down a job I was doing okay in Mm -hmm. my course it's that idea of I was sort of coping um Mm -hmm. And, and I think that's where sometimes it can be difficult because we might have this stereotypical idea of what depression is, that it's someone mm-hmm. who isn't working, can't get out of bed. And I definitely had days where that was really difficult. But because most of the time, you know, on the surface, it probably looked like I was fine. Maybe I was a bit tired. Um, I think it's easy to kind of go under the radar or to feel like, well, I'm still working, so it can't be that bad. Um, mm-hmm. So, yeah, yeah. I mean, that, that makes perfect sense because I, I think usually when people talk about depression, it's like, oh, you know, the, pe- the, the, the only one type of depression where you can't really get out of bed and you're, you can see that the person is not doing okay. But there's also high function dep- depression, like you mentioned, where every, on the outside, you look like you're perfectly fine. And that's when usually when people go out and talk about depression, they're like, oh, you can't be because you seem fine. And I feel like, that is the most common misconception that it can be in different forms. And some people, they, they seem fine during with people having conversations, they're perfectly fine. But the moment that's all gone, it's like an instant switch off. And I think that needs, more people need to talk about that. And what were your um, initial, how did you, what were your like coping mechanisms like when you were depressed? Yeah. I- um, I, th- I feel like I slept a lot. <laughs> mm-hmm. So there was a period in my 20s where and it was probably one of the, the, the worst kind of depressive episodes I had where I went to work. And, and like you said, you know, you're going to work and you're masking, which takes a lot of energy to kind of try and put on this face. that Everything's fine. And I thought I was doing all right at that. But actually, people I work with later said I was like a robot. <laughs> so I probably wasn't actually doing as well as I thought. Um, So I essentially was kind of working and then going home and sleeping. Mm. And, uh, you know, and um, one of my other coping mechanisms has been comfort eating. And that particularly if you're in a low mood, you've not got much energy because, again, the masking takes energy and and you've not really got the interest and stuff. Kind of go for like the all the yummy, (laughs) sweet, sugary, Mm -hmm. fatty stuff for that energy boost. Um, And so that then there was a cycle because then you'd feel low. So you comfort eat for that energy and then you would feel rubbish because you'd eaten Mm. stuff that um, probably isn't the healthiest. And, and so, and then that has an impact on your body image and all of that. So that's like another vicious cycle that was going on at the, at the same time. But um, yeah, I feel like a lot of sleep um, and also just trying to just get on with it, just kind of do stuff. Um, a lot of uh, kind of, you know, when you just like veg on the sofa a little bit and you're like mindlessly scrolling or Mm. binge watching something and you're not really engaged with it. It's just on and and it can feel like so much effort to kind of get up and do something else. So you just Mm. kind of stay there and and people maybe can relate to that a little bit that like, oh, I should go to bed now, but it it feels like so much effort to get up Mm -hmm. and (laughs) move and go to bed. (laughs) But just that 
most of the time. Um, mm. Yeah. So it's, it's interesting because, you know, you think about coping strategies, but I'm not sure that I was really <laughs> coping that well with them. It's just trying to just get by, really. Mm. Because um, there's this thing that, you know, I've realized that over the years, even like me suffering with depression, is that it, there isn't a complete cure for it. And it's like an often like an up and down cycle, depending on which phase you are in your life. And it's just mostly about learning how to deal with it rather than having like a magic cure that makes it goes away. Although that sounds beautiful. <laughs> Yeah, but it, that's not unfortunately how it works. So, you know, when you're coping with depression and you were, you knew how to deal with it better. And then after a while, is was there a period where you sl- slipped into it again? And did people not take it as much seriously because they thought you were cured in a way? Yeah, I feel like actually, um, I'm not. My family and friends, I think, understand it a bit more now. It's funny because mm-hmm. I think for a while, my stepmom especially was a bit like what but now I don't know whether it's she's listened to my podcast and now sometimes she's like oh, I'm quite concerned about your mental health when I'll be like mm-hmm. I feel fine uh, but I get that's good in a way that, that you know there's that yeah. understanding there and taking it seriously but I feel like our healthcare service or the the mm-hmm. people that I have been in contact with have been really good at supporting and kind of understanding and, and that kind of thing but definitely like you said um it's I feel it's like waves or it's like cycles um so and and that's I had another realization as I was turning 30 which was really interesting because I kind of look back on my 20s and I'd known I had depressive episodes where it was really Mm. not great where I was depressed um and then when I didn't feel so bad I thought I was okay so I thought I was depressed Mm. not depressed depressed not depressed then when I look back I was like "Mm, I wasn't really okay (laughs) for like the whole of my 20s and I wasn't as depressed I wasn't like in the depths of that kind of dip but I still wasn't not depressed um Mm -hmm. you know and um and I and I think for myself again like you say it would be lovely if there was like this magic cure and suddenly Mm -hmm. like whoa depression's gone but I feel for myself it's about being aware of myself and Mm -hmm. looking out for my own warning signs and trying to to kind of manage it and I know that you know this kind of next period of my life I'm at that sort of age where I'm thinking do I want to have a family or not but I'm Mm -hmm. very aware that probably postnatal depression would be an experience I have Mm -hmm. because I'd be predisposed to it because of my my kind of history and it's something that I'm going to have to probably be aware of for the rest of my life Mm -hmm. and manage which in a way you're kind of like you think oh so tiring to to think about it but actually um, over the last couple of years, I've had the first periods that I can remember where I felt not depressed. And mm. that's been a really good place to be in. I think with, with COVID, with lockdown, um, you know, there have been times where it's been like, actually, I'm maybe not in the best place at the moment. I'm not sure if I'm fully depressed, but definitely my mood has mm. dipped to a point that I need to be mindful of it. But um, I feel having had that experience of going, oh, I'm, I'm not depressed at the moment. Mm-hmm. I, I kind of know what I put in place then. So I have more healthy coping things that help with my mood. Um, so yeah, it's, it's a weird one, isn't it? Cause you kind of, you can look at the rest of your life and think, Oh, I'm mm-hmm. going to always have to be aware of this, but now I know that it, it can be okay. It's just, mm-hmm. you know, kind of part of how I experience life, I guess. Um, so in a way I'm optimistic about it, <laughs> which hopefully comes across for anyone listening. They're not going, Oh dear it's um yeah. you know yeah yeah I mean I guess like, like like you said it's 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 a very hard thing to kind of think about all of things like in the future if I want to have a kid then you're like oh my god this might happen and what if it's really hard to struggle like that to deal with and it is a lot of pressure I would say because knowing now that you're fully aware of how depression works and how you know all the stages that you've been through it's definitely a struggle I would say but it's it's good that you are coming to terms with the fact that there is a possibility but you're being optimistic about it I think at the end of the day it's really about being optimistic and being like making a change and not really being in that victim mindset because I think that itself really makes things a lot more easier and yeah I want to know how you have dealt with depression. Do you take medication for it or do you just go into the 
like people say, the natural route or, you know, like exercising and all yeah. of those things. Yeah, so uh, I'm not taking meds at the moment, but I have several times. Um, and to be honest, I've not been the best with taking meds and being compliant because I know <laughs> coming off meds can be a big thing. And I've tended to, and I do not recommend this, just stop. And I realized I was, I was traveling the last time I'd been on meds and I stopped and I got really bad vertigo. Um, so every time I was laying down, the room was spinning and I was thinking, why am I getting this again? And then I kind of put two and two together that every time I just stop my meds, I get vertigo because suddenly your brain is like, whoa, what's happening? You have this kind of crash. So I wouldn't recommend just stopping cold turkey, even though that's what I did. Um, but I, I took meds through my 20s, uh, you know, a few times. And really it was to help me function, you know, to get to a level of being able to function. But the, the way that I view meds is that if you imagine you're, you're really low and all of the things that people say are really good for your mood, really good for depression. So the exercise and the sleep and the food and the connection, when you're really depressed, it's so hard to find the energy or the willpower or, or whatever to do those things mm -hmm. because it, it's so much effort. And for me, the meds kind of just brought me up to a level where I could do those things that would have like a lasting impact. Um, and for me, I feel like the root of my depression was a lot about my self-worth, how I viewed myself. I really hate, hated myself and it feels like a really strong word to use, but it's true. <laughs> I was really not in a good place in myself. And, and so for me, all the time I was taking meds, they allowed me to function, but they didn't deal with like that root uh, cause of a lot of my depression, not entirely, but a lot of it. Um, and so then when I kind of had this realization when I turned 30 that, well, I've actually been depressed for a long time. I thought I'm, I'm not okay with the next 10 years not being okay. So I need to do something different. Um, and I kind of did it like an experiment because I was like, I already feel crummy. So we'll give it a go. We'll see what happens. And so I, I Googled and I've done this before, but I Googled what helps with depression <laughs> and like the, you know, the classic things come up, exercise, <laughs> sleep, food. And I was like, oh, it's so boring. But I was like, I'll try it because mm -hmm. I've got nothing to lose and I will, you know, I will give it a go. Guess what? <laughs> you know, it works. There's, there's a reason that, that people say those things help um, because, because they do. But I think mm -hmm. you have to be in a place where you can kind of Actually, make that commitment. for yourself to do it. Yeah. And so my thing with exercise, and again, that's something I've really noticed with lockdown when the gyms have been shut, because for me, I have to put these like psychological things in place. So I have <clears> to <throat> go and do it. So with my gym, you have to book in in advance. Usually there's like a social element. So that helps. But if you cancel on the day, you get charged because you've taken someone else's place. So I'm like, I don't want to pay. So, <laughs> so, <laughs> not go. so I, so it's that commitment. Like I have to go. And my, my thing has been, for me, it's been the consistency. So if I can get there, even if I only put in like 20% effort, mm -hmm. I'm there, I'm doing something. And that for me um, has worked. And also kind of finding the type of exercise that works for me and that I enjoy. And that doesn't mean that some days I'm not like, oh. mm. <laughs> I went on, I went on Friday because um, the gym had just reopened and I'd been Monday and Thursday and done like a reasonable workout on Friday. I, my body was aching. I was tired, but I went and I kind of did something because I was like, <laughs> you know, back, back in it. Um, and, you know, and I, I still, it's, it's funny because um, I do interviews as well on my podcast and I record them. And then it's usually a couple of months later that I listen back and edit. Mm -hmm. And often <laughs> I've spoken to someone and they'll talk about things that are good for well-being. And so sometimes I'll be like, yeah, I'm, I'm doing really well with that. And then I'll listen back and go, oh, well, I lost that <laughs> somewhere along there. Or I'll listen and go, oh, I said this last year, but actually now I'm, you know, and so it's, you know, it's really variable. I, I find that I, I think even with that, I get into cycles where sometimes I'll be in a really good headspace and I'll be really doing everything and feel pretty good. And then there'll be a dip and then I'll, mm -hmm. You know, it's just been Easter. I've ate way too much chocolate. I've not wanted to do anything. And then sometimes it takes a while to notice. And then you go, oh, actually, I'm not doing those things that I know really help me for my mood. And um, but then there's noticing and then there's doing something about it because I've noticed that and I've been aware of that all through March, but have chosen not really to do anything about it. Um, 
So I, I think it's, yeah, for me, a lot has been that self-awareness and knowing myself and listening to myself and taking action and finding ways that to almost like trick myself into doing it when I'm not going to be in the mood for it or it's going to be difficult. And, and I think that there are still areas of my life that I find really difficult um, to manage. So for example, <laughs> one of my things when I'm feeling really low is laundry. Laundry mm. just feels like such an effort. Mm-hmm. And my partner said to me before, like, no one likes laundry. And it's like, it's not a case of like or dislike. It's just, it just, I don't know, it isn't on my radar until I'm like, I'm running low on clothes. <laughs> I better do some. It's, it just, it's, I don't know why it just feels really hard to do. So like at the moment I'm functioning pretty well. I'm, you know, mm-hmm. and I'm doing things that are good for my mood, but laundry, I'm still not on top of my laundry. So it's kind of, <laughs> you know. Yeah, I mean, that, that completely makes sense. It's it's really about, there's just some things, like you mentioned, laundry. It's like, for me, it's like cleaning my room. I like, I, I, it's, it's funny because I like it super clean, but it's the effort that takes to do that. It just seems like so much effort to, you know, make the start. But once I do, it's like, oh, I, I'm done. Like, I, I'll be like on, on the go. But it's about being pushing yourself to get to that point. And, yeah. you know, there's, there's so much stigma around mental health that, like, for the past few years, like, talking about mental health has been really, like, more, like, people are more open to talk about it, and there's more talks on social media, especially, and even uh, celebrities are coming and talking about their mental health, which is really great. But this wasn't the case, like, even a few years ago, it wasn't really that common. So what, uh, men- what um, stigmas do you think still surround the topic of mental health? Yeah, and and I agree. I think we've we've got a lot better, and and I feel like things like depression, anxiety, uh, OCD to a certain extent. There's much more understanding and awareness, mm-hmm. but when you get to things where you have psychosis involved, mm-hmm. I feel like there's still a lot of stigma around those conditions and the fear uh, around that. Um, but I think one of the the um, some of the biggest ones are that idea of like, well. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna get it. I'm fine. I'm strong. I'm never gonna, you know, um, but it can happen to anyone because you don't know what's going to happen, whether it's a life experience or, or something. So there can be that stigma of like, but it's not going to affect me. It's not something I have to, to worry about. Um, I think one of the big ones, like we said, was that pre- how it presents. So having that really narrow view of this is what depression is, which can mean that if you don't fit into that box, you might worry that people won't take you seriously if you say, look, I'm struggling. And they might not take you seriously. But it also means if you are feeling low, you might actually be depressed, but you're kind of going, well, I'm not because it doesn't look like this. Mm -hmm. And that might put people off seeking support. And you get into this idea of self-stigma where, and I still fall into this sometimes, where you kind of think you talk to people and they've had awful experiences and you kind of think, well... I've not had anything like that. So I shouldn't feel the way that I feel. And you can kind of minimize your own experience because you're comparing yourself. And then you can kind of beat yourself up and say so you're stigmatizing yourself, which can be a really difficult place. Um, so yeah, I feel like we've come a long way, but there's still a lot around, I guess, um, still also that idea that it's a weakness in some way and mm-hmm. you know you still sometimes get those or just snap out of it just do this just do that and um which you know people can mean well when they mm-hmm. say oh have you tried this but it doesn't often come across that way you know um mm-hmm. and and I think something like the exercise even <laughs> even though it worked for me it took me a long time to get to that place and it still wasn't like a magic bomb it wasn't like oh look I'm exercising now I'm never going to be depressed ever again so I think having some realism that those things generally help me manage kind of my my hormone levels and they help me to let out some stress they help me to look after myself be more in tune with myself and they help me with my well-being and that helps my depression but it doesn't kind of fix it because I think it's maybe just like my natural default is to to kind of slip into that place if things are difficult or if I'm not looking after myself or for whatever reason um yeah 
Yeah, I mean, I completely, I completely get that. And I feel like it's, it's usually about it's not happening to me. So I don't really have to care about it sort of mindset. And yeah. I think it's so natural to get to that point because people are only concerned with things that there is a possibility of it affecting. And usually depression is more accepted now because anyone can get depressed. And it's really either about genetics or in the situation that they're in. So it doesn't seem very harmful, but things like bipolar disorder or even what's it called? Schizophrenia, schizophrenia, all of those disorders seem so crazy to people that they just identify and put them in the box of, oh, they're just, you know, they're not well in their head. And it yeah. just seems like too much for them to handle. So they don't talk about those things. And mm. all the Western countries, they're being more open to the talk of mental health and even campaigning towards to making, raising awareness about mental health and letting people get the help that they need. I know where you are right now is doing a lot of those works, but in Asia, it's still sort of um, a no-no sort of topic that people don't feel comfortable talking about because there's, they still haven't accepted the fact of mental health, which is why I want to ask about how are the, how are the campaigns like and what, what are the services and um, a lot of efforts that the companies do, uh, country is doing to raise awareness about mental health. Yeah, and, and I feel very lucky that I feel like the UK is in a pretty good, uh, reasonably good place <laughs> mental health <laughs> services uh, compared to other, um, other countries possibly. Um, and I think at the moment as well with COVID, people are talking about it a lot more uh, because there's appreciation that people who already had mental health concerns, it's maybe going to... Um, be compounded by this and people who maybe haven't ever struggled might struggle now um and so there there was a campaign that ran for a couple of years which i was part of as a, a champion called time to change and it was um a, 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 it was between two big mental health charities mind and rethink mental illness and it was funded by the government and it was all about encouraging conversations about mental health to challenge stigma um, and so it had champions like me, who are people with lived experience of mental health, having conversations. So they kind of normalized it. And, you know, when you, you can look at statistics and this vague idea of, oh, yeah, people have mental illness at times. But when you have people who have actually had that experience and are having conversations, that's really powerful. And it was a brilliant campaign. It had some really um, amazing little uh, things. The one I always talk about is their Ask Twice campaign, mm -hmm. which is the idea that uh, you know, you, you see someone, you're like, oh, how are you? And they say, I'm fine. And you mm. maybe think, hmm, are you? <laughs> <laughs> and it's just ask again, ask twice. And the, the cartoons for the campaign were amazing because there was like someone being eaten by an octopus. Mm -hmm. And going, are you okay? And they're like, oh, I'm fine. And it, like, they're clearly mm -hmm. not because they're being eaten by an octopus or whatever. <laughs> so it's really clever. Um, a really great campaign. But unfortunately, the government ended the funding for it. And mm. that finished in March. So some of that work is going to be taken up by mind um i know and possibly rethink who are you know two of the organizations who are part of it um but we have a lot of mental health charities um, i feel in the uk who have a range of services and campaigns and raising awareness so we're quite strong on on that front um in terms of services there are services that are funded by the the government so um, you know, obviously seeing your doctor for medication and um, for counselling, but the waiting lists for counselling and to get just a short period of counselling are ridiculous, sometimes up to 18 months. So, you know, you've kind of built up that I'm going to go to the doctor, I'm going to ask for help. And then they say, I'll add you to the waiting list, but it could mm. be a year, which is, um, yeah. So when I, um, I had, I had some CBT, so cognitive behavioral therapy when I was about 21. And that mm -hmm. actually was funded through my company because a lot of companies will have an employee assistance program, which has mm -hmm. like um, a support line. It has lots of different things. And sometimes they provide six or eight sessions of counseling. So I was able to use that because then I didn't have to have the waiting list. And I currently am in therapy and that's privately funded because, you know, <laughs> just mm -hmm. getting it on the health service is really difficult. Um, so then you do have lots of charities that have services. Um, so there's lots of peer support, 
there's um, a, a helpline, which it's under the kind of the suicide helpline, but actually for anyone in distress, but they're those kind of one-off services. So I, th- I think we've got a lot of services, but it still can be really difficult to find support. And, you know, I think it's something that a lot of people in the mental health space are saying, that, you know, that we're saying that it's something that we're really going to support and fund. But actually when it takes a year or more to actually get those services and if someone is in kind of crisis um you know that it's i think it's difficult for that early intervention support you know to to get that support before it reaches a point where someone possibly has to be hospitalized that that kind of thing um so yeah we're we're doing okay but i feel like we could be doing a lot Mm. more as well so yeah yeah that you're right i think waiting for a year to even get a diagnosis or even the help that you need it just seems like at the end at the end of the day i feel like there's no point to it because if you have to wait a year the person who needs immediate assistance or needs anything medication or whatever it is they they won't be able to do that and i think that kind of just loses the purpose of it yeah i think you can get you could get medication before then because you could mm. see your gp but when people say all I got was a prescription for antidepressants, really, it's that's pretty much all they've got to offer at that point. Because, you know, you can see your GP, it might take you like a week, maybe to get an appointment, depending how busy they might prescribe you medication. Because at that point, that's all they've got, mm. you know. So yeah, I feel yeah. like therapy works for most people than medication, because not everybody works well with medication because with the side effects and everything. I feel like it's just really de- uh, met depression. Like the, um, there isn't a cure. So every every way to cope with it, everyone deals with it differently, and everyone, you know, they react to medication differently. They some people they're good with medication, some people are not. Some people would rather get therapy because it's more it helps them better. So I think it's really about having a personalized plan rather than just you know. Okay, you're depressed, here you go. Here's throwing some antidepressants at them and then hoping it works. Yeah. Yeah. I was really lucky the um a few years ago, so the most recent time that I went to to my doctor uh, for medication and there was something that the surgery that I went to had in place that might not be true for, for every doctor's, but they had a mental health nurse who specifically met on a, a monthly or every couple of months with people on within the surgery service so although it wasn't therapy it was someone that you could have that check in with and go and see um actually it might have been more frequently to start with so you still felt like you were getting some kind of support someone you could talk to um mm-hmm. and she was great when i when i was seeing her but i don't think that's the norm unfortunately but that gave an extra something that you actually had a person you could see if you're really struggling and you know mm-hmm. they could support I think it's really about making the conversation more acceptable. And that's what I wanted to come back to. Um, medication is something that it still has a stigma against it because people, they don't really want to go on medication because they think that that might just actually define the fact that they're depressed or the fact that they need help. So do you think there's still a stigma around getting medica- like getting the medication for your mental illness? And how, did you ever face that? Yeah, I, I think there still is. And and I think, you know, sometimes you speak to people and, and their fear is about being on it forever mm. and kind of coming off and that coming off can be difficult. Um, and actually it was when I was seeing the mental health nurse, I mean, we talked about that potentially I might end up being on it, you know, forever to, to kind of manage. And, um, you know, and it's, I personally, you know, I feel like I'm kind of okay with medication and, and stuff anyway that, um not everyone is the same, but I kind of feel like actually if something um, doesn't feel right and there's medication, then I'm going to give it a go and I'm going to listen to my body and what my body kind of says. Um, And actually I was really lucky because the, um, the first medication that I tried seemed to work for me. And then we sort of played around with the, the dose a little bit over the time. But like you said, sometimes it can take a while to find the right Mm. combination for you and I think sometimes people try one they think oh it doesn't work but Mm -hmm. actually maybe there's a slightly different one uh, that might Um, but I think it's it's interesting isn't it because there are some people who maybe are just like I don't want to take any medication for anything I want to explore natural 
uh, methods. And that can be for any kind of ailment, whether it's physical or mental. And then there are some people who would happily take paracetamol or painkillers or mm -hmm. physical medication. But when it's mental, there's a really interesting thing that when it's the brain, we feel like we should be able to control that. Like we should be mm -hmm. able to control how we feel, what's going on with our mood. And if we take medication, it's I failed in some way. There's something wrong with me. But we don't apply the same thing to our body. Like if I, <laughs> my muscles hurt or I've broken my leg, we're not like, I shouldn't be feeling pain. That's my, my fault. I'm going to have to like just deal with it because, mm -hmm. you know, and, and so I think often people will much happily take a medication for a physical thing than they will for mental. Mm -hmm. And I think that's where we need to change that. Actually, it's all, you know, we have some control over what our mind and our body's doing, but not complete control. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and, and I think that's where sometimes you can, I don't know if you've seen these sort of cartoons where it's people saying to someone who's depressed uh, or with any mental illness, like, oh, you know, don't take meds, just do this. But you wouldn't say it to someone who's diabetic, like, oh, no, no, don't take your insulin, just, <laughs> just do this instead. And, and they're equally not under our control, you know, mm -hmm. <laughs> like exactly. that insulin, that's to do with, that's to do with hormonal stuff with insulin and everything and depression often is to do with the neurotransmitters and serotonin uh, and whatever and we don't quite understand it we quite we don't really understand how antidepressants work to be honest but it's it's not under our control and I think that is the big stigma that we feel like it should be mm -hmm. and so when something goes wrong we often whether it's conscious or not we can feel like oh it's I should be able to control this I shouldn't uh, be experiencing this and I think that's a big part of the medication that we then sort of think well I shouldn't have to take it because I should be able to just make myself okay and that is not how it works <laughs> yeah. unfortunately um so uh, and I've I've been lucky I think that I've not personally experienced any stigma around taking medication but um and I'm fairly um open about my mental health and, and fairly kind of okay but there is a lot you still see sometimes in in the media where people will say things or they'll say stuff about you know, crazy pills or taking yeah. meds and so there can be still that view um, and I think often it comes back to that idea of the weakness and the control that there is something wrong with you if you need uh, to take the medication and I think that's a really harmful view to hold or you know for us to be having because then people who could really benefit from that that medication are possibly avoiding it and and like I said before I feel like it brings you up to a level to then be able to do the other stuff that mm. can be beneficial you know I think if you're if you're really low if you're really in a depressive episode and you're trying to do these things that are going to make you feel better maybe they will but it's going to take you so much more effort to mm. do them and be really tiring where medication can kind of like bridge that difference. So then you're a bit more able to, mm. to kind of engage. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think I completely, I, I definitely agree with you because I think just because it's some white people think everything is under their control because you know, it's really about controlling your mind, but there are a lot of things that are going on in our body and our mind that we don't know of. And, you know, it just really needs that extra help and we shouldn't be cutting it off from that, getting it. And I think it's definitely about this whole thing that you know, if they need the medication that kind of just justifies the fact that they actually need help and people are just too afraid to admit that to, them, to themselves. But there's really nothing wrong with getting that extra help. If that means that you can be more productive, if you could get out of that feeling so in a low I think it's definitely worth giving it a try and they're you know, getting off medication as well should be talked to a doctor before as well as <laughs> getting on it. I think it definitely <laughs> does. Help. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah. When it's a, a personalized thing, isn't it? To kind of, to, to manage that. Mm -hmm. um, but I think there's some, if you want to get into, sh into shape, you'd mm -hmm. see like a personal trainer because you'd be like, they're the expert. They can help me. You know, if you wanted to get a mortgage, you'd see like a financial advisor. But for some reason, like, oh, no, I don't want to like see a therapist or talk to anyone about what's going on with my mind. <laughs> it's like a, we've got a weird relationship with it. But I think there's something um, sometimes potentially harmful where you get lots of like self-help people. And, you know, I'm a coach as well. And I'm very mindful of doing this, that, yes, there is an extent to where we can 
you know, choose how we respond to things and we can change the stories we tell ourselves and we can change our mindset. But that I think there's a limit to that. Mm -hmm. And sometimes you listen to things and, and I kind of think, well, I can't just think myself out of my depression. Like if I could, I probably would have done that before. Um, And, and when people like, you know, you just got to do it. You just got to decide. You've just got to, you know, all those things that maybe sometimes can be helpful. And absolutely. I, sometimes I, I say I'm like walking this line, but I have to check in with myself and know, is this a time I actually can't do that thing and I need to be kind to myself or is it a time where I'm using it as an excuse and being a bit lazy and actually, the kindest thing to do is give myself a bit of a kick up the backside and make myself do it. And, and I need to kind of be the judge. Of that. And sometimes it's, I'm being lazy, but I'm like, I'm still not going to do anything about it. Um, and, and so sometimes those messages can be quite harmful because they suggest that everything is completely under our control. And if we just changed our mindset, we'd be fine. Mm-hmm. And, and I, I don't think that's true. Because like you said, there's so much about the mind that is not under our control anyway. Mm-hmm. We don't understand or um you know it's unconscious so i think there is an element of that but there is also that being kind to yourself and giving yourself a bit of grace and going actually i just can't do that today or i'm just Mm -hmm. not in that headspace and Mm -hmm. so sometimes you kind of need to sit in it a little bit um Mm -hmm. until you can kind of feel able to i don't know do whatever (laughs) it is to to kind of start trying to feel better if that makes sense I, I completely agree because I think there's with social media, anyone and everyone is a mental health, you know, advocate. And it, when it comes, it, it has a great responsibility. I think there's nothing wrong with doing that. It's amazing talking about mental health, but I feel like not everyone will be able to just, you know, pick uh, get that enough energy to pick up themselves and do everything. You know, even if they're being in a slump, I think it really comes with knowing when you are like you mentioned being lazy or when you really need that help and the one that the one thing that really makes me angry is that toxic positivity is that well if you really wanted to do it you would have done it i'm like that's not how it works <laughs> you, <laughs> yeah. it's not your mind doesn't always cooperate with you and that's because it needs something else more and that is when you have to go to a professional and get it checked out as to why you're feeling that way there's only so much we can do to push and there's so many different messages that we get like oh you need to go outside you know you need to have a walk you need to go to the gym you need to eat healthy but there's only so much doing all of those things can help after after that point you need a professional help and I think it's yeah. really about admitting that. Yeah, there's a really nice, um, and I, yeah, I agree completely about like toxic positivity and all of that. And I try my podcast to be kind of balanced, not like really miserable, like, oh, it's so difficult always. Mm. Um, but not like, hey, it's all great. And, you know, like a balance and be real. And if I'm, um, I try and put a positive spin on it, but if I've had like a not great week, I'll say, mm-hmm. you know, it's been a tough week. And I think it's about being real. Um but there's a, yeah, a great analogy. And this was partly, the first half was given to me by the CBT therapist I saw. And then I've added the second bit about the other types of therapy. And so CBT therapist said, you know, you, you're, in, you're driving your car, you drive along the road and you drive over a nail and you get a puncture and you take it to the garage and you want them to fix it. Um, and her question was, what's more helpful for them to fix the wheel so you can go on your way or to go back down the road and find the nail that you drove over? And the idea being that CBT therapy kind of patches you up so you can carry on. And so all of those things like going for a walk, the exercise, which can be really good, they're that kind of, you're fixed, you're going to carry on your route. But, might this my addition, if you are driving over that same nail every day <laughs> and you're just trying to patch it up, you need to go back down the road with someone to mm-hmm. find it so you can get it off the road so you're not going to get it <laughs> And that's where some of those longer term therapies, like the talking therapies or whatever, are, can be really valuable because if there is something that you are stuck on that is going to keep tripping you up, then it's really valuable to explore that. And and so I'm sort of um, torn when you have people who are like, oh, yeah, you just need to do this or uh, this quick treatment and suddenly it's going to fix all your problems. And maybe it's going to be beneficial, but I find... Um, 
you know, with when I've been coached and had therapy, it's like an onion mm-hmm. or anything with layers. <laughs> you peel off a layer and you're like, oh yeah, I'm, I'm fine now. Like I feel good. And then there's another layer. Uh, and so it's almost like you have to do a bit of work and then you kind of stabilize a little bit and then you're like, oh, and then something else mm-hmm. kind of comes up or you'll notice something else. And I think it's that process. And I feel like actually that could be ongoing forever. You know, we're always growing, we're always changing, we're always kind of tripping ourselves up over stuff. And we're never like a complete fixed, I'm perfect, like I'm done Mm -hmm. kind of thing. It's a continual process. And actually, probably if you had a good therapist and you were in therapy for life, I'm not saying that's what you should be, but if you were, you probably would keep coming up to stuff because there's always stuff that you can explore and, you know, kind of understand yourself more or process. Um, Definitely. Yeah. Yeah, I think there's so many things that's going on within us that we don't even know why we're doing certain things. And definitely going to a therapist and talking about it will help you realize that, oh, wait, that's why I'm acting this way. That's why I'm afraid of this. And it's really an eye opener. And I never understood before, like a few years ago, I never understood the value of therapy. And so I went into it myself. Because people will always be like, oh, you know, you're just talking about it to you, to a person, you know, just talking about your problems. What benefit is that going to do for you? But when you realize the core issue as to why you're acting a certain way or why it's difficult for you to do certain things, you realize that, okay, so it's really a great indicator of your issues and problems. So then you can put the effort into working towards that to heal that part of yourself rather than just, you know, pretending like everything is fine and just going on and ha- finally having a breakdown or anything. That is definitely why it's important to take a break when you need to take a break. And mm-hmm. that is something that I truly believe in, is that when your body and mind is telling you that you need a break and you're about to burn out, you, you should take a break. And I know that people will be like, oh, you're being lazy or anything like that. But there's nothing wrong with taking some time for yourself and really just looking at, you know, you're putting yourself first. I think that is the most important thing. And mm-hmm. I want to know, like, do you think there's any other mental stigmas? Uh, there's any other stigmas that surrounds mental health right now and how we can make the conversation about mental health more open and acceptable? Mm. Um, I mean, there's probably loads more. I feel like we've covered the main ones, but I think that um you know when you said about toxic positivity i think that's uh also dangerous when you get into that um you know i, I think you know I, I when i look back i've probably had depression for like at least like 20 years since i was probably about 11 uh, or 12 or something like that and so having it for that long you can see that there are periods in it you know whereas you could have someone who's had like one depressive episode and some people might only have one but then if they're like you do this thing and then that's it that's sorted and mm-hmm. you just that's not going to be everyone's experience and so I think when you have anyone saying this is the thing you have to do and that is going to sort it we're all unique individuals and our mental health is all different and so it's that kind of personalized approach and just because something worked for one person doesn't mean it'll work for you like try it but it might not work and so when you think about medication you know, the one that works for me might not work for you. Uh, Therapy, it might be a different type of therapy that is the one that connects with you. And you might meet a therapist and think, I don't get on with them. They're Mm -hmm. not the right uh, therapist for me. Um, And so, you know, and I think sometimes we can be like, we'll try one and think, oh, that's not working. (laughs) It's it's finding, you know, the, the right one for you. And yeah, appreciating that it's an individual thing, which is why I think getting to know yourself is is so important. But um, I think the more that people with lived experience can share and you can hear all these different voices sharing their experience, it, it kind of widens your perspective of what it is like and and kind of normalizes it that we, that we all have diff- difficult times, um, that there can be some kind of like recovery or being in a better place but also that realism of actually things might be tough again. It might come back, but that's okay. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, you know, I, 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 maybe I'm really lucky that I've spoken to lots of people on the podcast who share their experience. So now I feel like I, I've, 
you know I know lots of people we can have this conversation about mental health and be kind of on the same page and be like yes it's personal and you know um, being open sharing your own experience being a little bit vulnerable first can really help someone um and but maybe not everyone has access to that or has had those conversations and I think they can be really valuable um and I think also the um you know, one of the things with therapy, yes, it's a professional who can help you explore, but there is also something really valuable about having that space to talk about what is going on, mm. where someone isn't judging you, um, or they might be, but they're not going to tell you. <laughs> <laughs> um, and they're not going, I think you should do this. I think you should do that. Because that often is what family and friends do, because they don't want you to be suffering. They mean well, but they're not really hearing you and you feel like no one's listening to me. Mm. And there's something really powerful about just having that space to talk and explore it without someone trying to fix it. And you know, I think although people mean well, they can't fix it for you. So actually just listening and allowing you that space to talk can be really beneficial. Um, but I think with a therapist, they can help you move forward. So you're not stuck <laughs> in that victim <laughs> kind of mode and in the same thing and um you know I think sometimes maybe family and friends if you're stuck in that place can lose patience a little bit they're like oh, I just want you to sort it out and like move mm. on whereas a therapist is <laughs> they're going to try and help you but they're not going to say look we talked about this last week <laughs> let go uh, <laughs> so <laughs> yes. if they do they're not a very good therapist yeah, that's, that's a good indicator <laughs> yeah but, I mean yeah all you said it makes perfect sense and I think it's okay to not be in a state where you're perfectly fine and you know everything is okay with you. It's it really comes with that realization that you need help and working towards getting help. I think that takes a lot of strength to even get to that point of okay, I want to change something about myself and realizing that you need that extra help. So it's nothing about being weak. It's nothing about not being um, functioning right or anything like that. What people usually make them believe it's really it takes a lot of strength to get to that point so anyone who wants to seek help you're incredibly strong and mm -hmm. I had an amazing time talking to you and before we end this episode do you have any final thoughts to share Ooh, final thoughts um yeah I, I guess my my final thought and and kind of linked to what you were just saying about reaching out for support and I absolutely would would recommend that if you are struggling um, but also it is really hard to do mm -hmm. and, you know, to be kind to yourself if it's something you don't feel able to talk to family and friends about. Um, sometimes it's easier to talk to a stranger, to mm -hmm. talk to a professional. Uh, so things like if there's a, a helpline somewhere where you are or a text service or your GP, that can be an easier step. Um, and so I talk to my therapist and I do talk to some friends and family and I talk on podcasts like this. I still find it really hard to reach out to family and friends when I'm struggling for help because I'm a sort of very independent, I'm just going to deal with it kind of person. So even though I know that they would be supportive and be that, I still find it really difficult. And there's a lot about not wanting to burden them and all this kind of complex stuff. So if you're listening and you think, I, I can't talk, I don't feel like I can talk to my friends and family, that's okay. It is really hard to do, but try and talk to someone there hopefully where you are are other services that you can talk to and peer support can be a really great way because then it's people who kind of understand um you know the, the experience and what, something I always sort of talk about is being kind to yourself because mm -hmm. you know it is it is tough and some days harder than others but you know you're kind of you're still here and you're still <laughs> kind of struggling through so yeah just kind of be kind to yourself and appreciate I you know I, I did one of these things once where you kind of uh, write to your future self. I don't know if you've ever seen it. There's a website called Future Me. <laughs> when I was like in my, in my 20s, I wrote this letter to myself when I turned 30. And something I'd said to myself was like, you know, you are stronger than you give yourself credit for, you know, and to kind of be dealing with everything you're dealing with and to still kind of be, you know, here and still, um, yeah, going for it in some way takes incredible strength. And like you said, it's, it's not weak. Mm. to um to be struggling it's and you know reaching out for support 
is really hard to do. Um, and I guess the other thing then is the, the ask twice campaign that I mentioned. Mm -hmm. So if you are a friend and if someone that, you know, um, for me, if I'm struggling, I tend to withdraw. So I'll, I'll stop kind of communicating so much and disappear. So if you have a friend and you notice some kind of change in them and you're concerned, ask them how they are, ask twice um, and just kind of let them know that, that you are there for them. Because even if they don't reach out, that will be really positive for them to know that they've got people around them. So, That's great. I think those are amazing things that people yeah. should definitely try and really asking twice, like you mentioned, is a great way because nobody really, it's like an automatic response for us to be like, oh yeah, I'm fine, yeah, I'm okay. Yeah. But when you really ask twice, it kind of makes a huge difference and you never know who might need help and who's just kind of bottling everything in. So really like being there for a friend or family member or anyone can make a huge difference. And yeah. for everyone listening, where can they find your podcast or like any social media that you like? Yeah. Um, so the podcast is called the Psyche Mental Wellbeing Podcast. So Psyche is P-S-Y-K-H-E. Um, and we are on uh, mostly Instagram and Facebook, but also Twitter uh, and, and TikTok now as well. Although I've not really done much on that. <laughs> and so we are Psyche Coaching. So P-S-Y-K-H-E Coaching or one word everywhere. Um, so yeah, you can kind of connect with us and on Instagram, we share like our most recent podcast episodes and blog posts and, and all of that kind of stuff. Um, and the website is just psyche, spelled the same way, uh, .co.uk um, and everything is on there as well. So Wonderful. All of those things will be listed in the description below. And I had so much fun talking to you, Hannah. Thank you so much for coming on. And for everybody listening, I will see you all next week.